exciting episode of Today with Tally. The mission and goal of this podcast is to bring an engaging conversation that will add value to the lives of everyday people. We will inspire, encourage, educate, and tell the stories of America's finest men and women in an effort to motivate you to live your life to its fullest potential. Be sure to follow us on social media and search Today with Tally. Be sure to subscribe, follow, and share the program as well. Ladies and gentlemen, your host of the evening, Mr. Brian Tally. Welcome back to Today with Tally podcast, where we add real life value to the lives of everyday people. We're on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Anchor FM, Spotify, and About Face Radio. Simply search Today with Tally. And be sure to like, share, and subscribe to get every episode and stay up to date with the latest and greatest our guests in this show has to offer. Folks, I want to give a shout out to our uh, to today's uh, show sponsor, Chase's Choice, uh, a company out of Canyon City, Colorado. Now, Chase's Choice is an industry leader in cannabis and hemp products and continues to heal those in need. Whether you are struggling from physical pain, anxiety, depression or having trouble sleeping, there is a product for you that will improve your quality of life. Ken, the founder of Chase's Choice, continues to engage in open conversation on the benefits of cannabis and hemp, CBD, CBG, CBN, THC, and all of the other cannabinoids found in the plant through extensive research and development. To learn more, visit Chase's Choice online today at chaseschoice.org. That's chaseschoice.org. Or call Ken directly, the owner, today. 719-371-0768. That's 719-371-0768. Now, CBD was Chase's choice. What's yours? Remember to always consult with your doctor before starting any alternative medicine products and always check with your state and local municipalities on the laws regarding the use of CBD and hemp products. Now, folks, We have a very special guest joining us on today's program. We have a man, a retired Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Army Green Beret Special Operations Flight Surgeon, Dr. Peter Chambers, joining us today. How are you, sir? I am happy to be alive, brother. Good to see you. Amen, amen, amen. You know, you you have had quite the career, quite the storied career. Again, I'm honored to have you on the show. I've, I've been so blessed over these last 170 days since I began this podcast. Looks like you're episode 114 today or 115. It's one of the two. But, you know, we, we continue to bring on folks like you that can add so much real life value to the lives of everyday people. And again, we couldn't do this program without men like you who stand up and fight for what's right and for the good of the country and, you know, have given really a lifetime of service. You know, you've served for 39 years, uh, uh, you know, as a U.S. Army flight surgeon and, and Green Beret and infantrymen, uh, you know, through, uh, you know, all, all of the battles. And, you know, you've got a, a Purple Heart, a Bronze Star, you know, a, a medal uh, a badge for, uh, you know, the medical uh, field and, and, and really at the end of the day, man, it, it, it is a honor to have, to have you on. Well, you know, I respect and honor your service too. And I was looking at your, your website and your previous uh, dealings with your ail- ailments as we all have when we, we've been in long enough or one day for that matter. Uh, and so I respect uh, your service and, and that as well. And all, all service members listening, uh, just know that I'm, I'm proud of every one of you. Outstanding, outstanding. So, Pete, give our listeners a little bit about you. You know, where were you born? What was life like growing up as a kid? Well, I was born in the uh, in uh, the middle, the fly one of the flyover states. Uh, in in a, and I went to a. My dad was a family doctor, and uh, we went to a small town, about three thousand to five thousand people, and uh, he was a family doc, and he was a patriot. Uh, he had served in his own capacity during World War II. Uh, and then uh, he got out and just uh, loved America. So when I was 18, he, he said, you're going you're gonna to give back to this country. I already knew that I was, and I knew that I wanted to. Uh, 
uh, family members in Vietnam and Korean War, et cetera. So uh, that's what I believed in, and, and, and I still do. I still do. Um, but I went in as a 11 Bravo. That's an infantryman. as a 0311 for the uh, Marines. And uh, I, I, you know, I served and didn't really know what I wanted to do in life. Always wanted to be a Green Beret from the very beginning. Uh, but God had a different plan for me, and I broke my leg somewhere along the way, and they told me, you can't jump out of planes anymore. And I said, okay, well, that's not going to happen. We'll figure it out. And so uh, I ended up getting out of the military and uh, going to medical school, or to college in medical school, and a uh, little break in service there. And I was in the reserves and then the IRR, but uh, came back in after 9-11 and uh, knew that, that what I was going to do was take care of the finest, and I did. And I was able to go to a special forces course. Uh, I kept applying to it until 2003 till 2012. And finally, they and I was a doctor. And uh, finally, they I resigned my commission to, to go back to being enlisted again. And I didn't get it done because when the general saw it, he said, well, Doc, I'm going to send you. I know you. And uh, I know that if there's anybody going to make it, you will because you're you're that guy. Because I was always with the troops, you know. I was always on the X, and the X being the place where you know things are flying real fast. So uh, I was I was blessed to be able to go. We got some more docs through after me, and it, it it was a it was a life changer, a career changer. I was able to work as a, as an 18 Alpha, which is a Green Beret officer, and as well as a uh, flight surgeon uh, up until 2015 on active duty. And then uh, from there on till this last year, I was in the Texas National Guard. The last year was on the Texas border, uh, Operation Lone Star. So mm -hmm. That brings me up to date. You know, you joined the U.S. Army in 1983. That would put me at six years old. <laughs> yeah, I, I get that a lot. And uh, sometimes they, they will ask me things like, How, what was it like on uh, Normandy Beach, sir? <laughs> well, I wasn't there. <laughs> but, uh, but 1983, and then would go on to serve 39 years. Now, what was? Yeah, I know that this is probably a really dumb question, but I'm going to ask. I'm, I'm going to ask it anyways. Your 39 years of service. Do you have one moment that really stood out to you that really may have changed the uh, the direction in the course of your life? The, what changed the direction the most was breaking my leg, actually, that that uh, because I was going to stay in enlisted the whole time. That was my goal. I, I love the military. That's my family. And uh, my I had a lieutenant and he told me, he said, hey, look, you're mad. You can't jump out of planes. I got it. Go to college, get your degree and do something with your life. And that was back in the 90s, you know, and so early 90s. So I said, Roger that, sir. I'll get out and I'll go do my thing. And uh, mm -hmm. that changed the course, but it was that, you know, mad about that broken leg, mad. I mean, I was, I was wanting to go to Ranger Battalion first and then, uh, and then go on to be a Green Beret. That didn't happen then, but one of those things where it was unfinished business for me and brought me back to the community, to the regiment. So really at the end of the day, if you never would have broken your leg, you would have never become a doctor. Correct. Yeah. I would have retired as a, probably an E8 or something and, uh, Probably, I, I would imagine I would have made it through special forces training. I'm, I'm the same person. I just went through it a lot older. Uh, selection was a booger bear, but uh, they uh, they would always say, well, there's the old guy that's passing us on the ruck. We better get up and start moving because we don't want him to beat us. <laughs> now, explain what a uh, special operations flight surgeon is. Uh, what were your details in your, in your job duties? Right. So as a special operations flight surgeon, uh, you're typically tasked out to a battalion level, and you are the special staff to the commander. So you advise the commander on operations, anything having to do with pre preventative medicine all the way to trauma care. Um, you, you, you help plan the missions. You help execute the missions should you need to go closer to the X and, and set up an aid station, et cetera. But in the special operations world, because we're using, we're using a high altitude, low opening or high altitude, high opening infiltration processes, you have to understand the hypobaric environment. So they send us to the flight school down at Fort Rucker. You don't want me behind the stick of a helicopter, but we still got to go through that course, right? Mm -hmm. So we do that and we are certified as a flight surgeon. 
So that's where I, I got that. But that was really so I could take care of operators that that, uh, that got to put on O's in order to jump out of the back of a perfectly good aircraft. Mm -hmm. Now, you would go on and you would retire um, as a lieutenant colonel. Uh, you know, you were a Green Beret um, and again, the special operations flight surgeon. After your 39 years of service, what did you begin to get into after you retired from the uh, military? That brings, that, brings me, that brings me to that moment of truth number two mm -hmm. that changed things. I was going to get out and uh, I have a little bit of land and I have some cattle and I was going to work cattle. That's what I was going to do. Unfortunately, when COVID came along and mandates came along for the military, it was my job not only to take care of the command's needs from medical realm, but also to take care of the soldiers. Really, in my my case, that's always where my heart's been. I always hang out with the enlisted guys and gals. So on Operation Lone Star on the border, Texas-Mexico border, 1,248 miles of uh, Rio Grande River, uh, I had uh, 600 soldiers to start, and then we increased to about 10,000. Uh, it's somewhere between that now. I don't want to give that number out. But uh, when I was doing informed consents and was told not to give informed consents and then ordered not to give informed consents by a two-star, I had to articulate that that was an unlawful order. And when you do that to a two-star as a lieutenant colonel, your life changes. I went from whatever position that I was in that many years, it didn't matter, rank, accolades don't matter. None of it matters when you go against the command in what is an unlawful order by regulation and by ethics and morals, um, and of, of which I've always operated legally, morally, and ethically for all those years. It's one thing I learned in the military. You can never go wrong. You can make mistakes. Mm -hmm. and you can fess up for your mistakes and you can after action report those mistakes and learn. But if you, if you do something unethical, you can't, you can't live with it and you can never get away from it. So I've maintained that. Uh, that's a tough thing. It's called personal courage. It's army value number seven, by the way. And, uh, what I ran into was officers uh, senior to me that exercise personal concern in its place. You know, some words come to me, you know, credibility, integrity, honor, courage, and commitment. You know, you can't, you, you know, you can't lose that. And plus, you know, you've got an oath, not only to the, to the country and the constitution, but to your soldiers as a surgeon, you know, as they fight them. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, so at the end of the day, you know, that oath, it means something. <laughs> um, you know, men like you. Now, explain this Operation Lone Star in, in this 1,248 miles of border when you were down there with your soldiers, because I'm not too familiar with it. Right. So uh, along the border, when uh, the Title 10 or active duty soldiers were down there before uh, Biden took office, that was... Uh, it was their job to rotate through different positions. We call those LPOPs, listening point, observation points, and pay attention to uh, the seams and the gaps, if you will. So when, when migrants come across, be it for whatever reason, if they're seeking asylum or if they're just looking for a better way, when, when those people come across, it's the Border Patrol's job to account for that activity. It's our job to look for the Seams and gaps, people bringing fentanyl, bringing, bringing guns, cartel activity to report uh, those types of things. And then based upon our rules of engagement to um, interdict if, if needed. That's, that's what we were to do when the, or that's what the soldiers were required to do. However, when the active duty soldiers pulled off the border, their typical rotations, it was incumbent upon Governor Abbott to, to uh, put people on state active duty orders, which are not active duty orders, and to do the job themselves. Operation Lone Star was created in order to do that, to uh, stand in the gap for the people of Texas, but also for the nation, because as, as dominoes fall, Texas would be the first one uh, should this invasion, I call it an invasion on the border, uh, overwhelm the system, and I believe that it has. Now, you were serving down there on Operation on Operation Lone Star during the Trump administration? Not during Trump, no. Uh, this would have been just during the Biden administration because during Trump administration, I was doing special operations duties in, uh, in the Middle East. 
So Operation Lone, uh, Lone Star was put together by Governor Abbott, correct? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Com okay. Combination between the uh, Department of Public Safety uh, paired up with uh, elements of their Texas Rangers and their uh, their tactical teams, if you will, as well as our uh, infantry unit down there and some other ancillary support units. Got it. So now I, I want to get into this whole wh whistleblower. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it says that, you know, you were, you know, fired, you know, from your operational position for performing informed consents to troops. And I know you had previously mentioned that, but a, a lot of our listeners and viewers out there may not understand or know what that means in terms that they can digest and understand. Can, can you explain to us all how this all unfolded? Sure. So um, before the mandates were required in August of uh, 21, uh, 22, sorry, before the, they were required by the DOD, it was optional. And so soldiers came on the border and that was very low vaccination rate. It was hovering right around 10% vaccinated because they're young and they didn't need to take it. They had been home. It was the National Guard. They get called on to, to state duty, state orders, and it was given as an option. Well, nobody took it. And so we just went about our business and we stayed operational, no problems. And we, you know, guys and gals are out there with body armor on all day, uh, eight hour shifts in the sun, heat indexes through the roof and uh, performing the task admirably. However, when the, when the mandates came, and there weren't enough vaccinated, they came to me because I was a task force surgeon and said, Doc, why are they not vaccinated? Why are the, the percentage rates so low? At that time, I had done informed consent. I typically informed consent is here's the good, the bad, and the ugly about this medication or thing that you're about to take. Or if it's a procedure, you have to have them sign off. Or, yes, take my tonsils out. So informed consent is something a doctor does under the oath with their medical knowledge and training, et cetera, and their expertise to say, this is why you need to take it or don't need to take it. It's your option, right? Mm -hmm. So most people didn't take it. I had at the time done about 3,000 informed consents. And I believe when I asked my senior medic that only about six people had taken it. That really made the command upset. <laughs> my boss has called me and said, and this is down on the border. So their headquarters is back in Austin. Doc, what's going on? Why are they not taking it? And we heard that you're doing informed consents. We want to see your brief. Well, I sent mm -hmm. them my brief. And they hemmed and hawed and carried on and belly ached all day long, but they 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 could not um, argue the fact that this was science. It was solid. What I was learning, studying, and all these things. Because remember, we didn't know a lot about it early on. Uh, but when I saw the VAERS data coming out and the DMED, Defense Medical Epidemiology Database, when that database was exposed or, or uh, spoken to uh, from Dr. Teresa Long, a flight surgeon at Fort Rucker, she said, take a look at this. I know you're down there in a fight. And uh, this might help you. And then I saw the numbers because I don't typically use that. That's like a public health thing. I use the I use the DMED. I looked at it, and I'll give you an example. Dur uh, post vaccine, six months after they came out, neurologic deficit, neurologic disorders went up 1,100 percent. That's an 11x rise from 2016 to 2020. They stayed pretty low. Typical military. This is across the DoD, not just down with us as soon as the vaccines came out and the mandates came out it was through the roof and i can't argue that and we're talking about other things like myocarditis stroke-like symptoms uh hemorrhagic so it's bleeds in the brain um basic things that you do not see if i had that many soldiers on a battlefield and that's called a, a dnbi to me it's a disease of non-battle injury it's not a wound but if i was in afghanistan and i got that many non-battle injuries, and I had to send them through launch tool, we would be combat ineffective. So I have to inform the command. And when I did, I said, you're making my troops combat ineffective. Well, why is that? Because 68% of the troops coming into my clinics down on the border, all the way across that border, I had PAs and medics everywhere. 68% of those people that were coming in the clinic that were sick were double vaxxed. That's a number. I'll stand by that number till the day I die. I had to testify about that number to a court in Tampa with the SEALs versus Lloyd Austin. I also gave my information to Senator Johnson out of Wisconsin who wanted to hear the data. We gave it to him. And then he said, I got to give your name. Otherwise, I won't take the data. 
you've got to, you know, expose your name. And I was like, well, I don't even have a, anything on the internet about me. When you work mm -hmm. in special forces, you try not to do that. But I had to give a name, and that's where part of the reason why I get on shows, uh, the first of which was uh, Alex Jones. <laughs> that was quite a trip. Um, but uh, now we're, 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 where we're at, where we are at with the mandates being dropped because of people like Trace Alone, Sam Sigloff, Lieutenant Bashal, the other whistleblowers. There are many more behind us right now. You shall remain nameless. Squashed. Well, yes, the uh, secret is out of the bag now about you being SF, <laughs> a Green Beret, a flight surgeon, and everything else, because you have upheld that oath to give uh, informed consent as any doctor, any surgeon, any, anybody uh, that takes that oath should be doing. Now, this is going on in Texas on right. the border. Now, as far as I knew, I thought that there was some, still some sort of a medical freedom and medical choice that was put forth by Governor Abbott. Was that not true? Right. And that's what the media would let, lend, you know, make you believe. Even our own Texas media, some of them are guilty of it. Um, he did say that he would not stand by the the mandate for the military. He would not allow it to happen to the soldiers that were on state active duty. However, he could not stop the DOD from holding their pay and allowances. And that's where the problem lays. Because when you aren't being paid to go to drills or to be on the border or to do whatever, and then like me, when I get pulled off my mission, lose my TRICARE and uh, specialty pays and all those things, and I'm getting paid you know, a basic rate, uh, which is fine. I don't mind that. But, you know, those those are things called shadow policies. And and you and I both know in the military, there are things that are shadow policies. And here, here's how they work. And I'll explain it for your listeners. When I was a private and I made a mistake, they told me to dig a hole and move that dirt over there. And then about six that evening, and I started about five in the morning, they got tired of telling me to go back and forth, keep filling holes. Well, I quit making mistakes. So that's not really a policy in the books, but it's a shadow policy. And some of those things are good. You know, it, it teaches you something. You never want to do it again. But in this case, these shadow policies are resulting in damages, possible deaths. I can't prove them. They're not authorizing us to do autopsies. But we've had several soldiers on the border that have died suddenly in their sleep. And nobody knows what it is because we can't investigate. Um, and that that's a problem. And that and that and so. Regardless of Governor Abbott saying that, this is not against him. What what the problem is, is that policy level things, as they go down through the strata of strategic level, operational, tactical level, the people that write the policies or make the policies don't follow up in, sometimes with the guys on the ground or the information is redacted before it gets to them so they don't really know what's happening. So there, it requires whistleblowing. So you blew the whistle. And yeah. that that reached um, and caught the attention of, of a lot of high level officials. Correct. And it and it and it was it wasn't just me. You know, once again, it was just a few of us. It was very few. If you think about the numbers in the DOD medical wise, even it's a very few that stood up. But from that, if you think about, you know, guys going onto a beach, if you got, you know, concertina wire, triple, you know, strand right before you're, you're trying to crawl up and you can't get there, somebody's got to run up and put a Bangalore torpedo under that wire and break it and go through, and then everybody can go through, and that's what happened. So now we've got enough to where the mandates were pulled uh, this last month. Are they going to reinstate mm. you? I know you're retired. But are they going to give you a public apology and, and sort of kind of reinstate that whole you were fired and, and terminated for that informed consent that you were given? Because that's the honorable thing to do here. Uh, and, 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 you know, that betrayal, I, I mean, really, at the end of the day, you give sure. a 39 year career and that betrayal that had to have been a, a massive uh, uh, K bar to the back, if you will. <laughs> yeah, you know. I, I'm, I'm happy being out and I, and I have other things that are happening, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, I miss my job. It's the best job I ever had. It always has been since day one of you know, fixing bayonets. I mean, I've always loved my job. But to me, um, and if, if, 
this is something to consider. If they're going to do that to a guy like me, and I'm not saying I'm, you know, General Flynn here, but but if they're going to do that to a guy like me, what are they doing to the lower enlisted? What are they doing to the to the younger officers that really uh, can be bowled over pretty easy, you know, uh, from their point of view? And some of them are staying. I've seen lieutenants stand up and say, no, this is wrong. You know, talking to battalion commanders, this is wrong, sir, uh, with all due to them. But if they're going to do that to me, what's going to happen to the ones that don't really have a voice, so to speak? But now we're seeing a, a push. But reinstating is key. And that's what I was on the Hill recently when they were voting on the National Defense Authorization Act, saying, hey, when you stop the mandates, you can't just do that. You got to give back pay. You got to allow people right. whose whose orders were flagged and not to have their normal uh, increase in promotions, and then you got to allow families that have gone on TEY, but the family member who refused to take a shot is stuck in Okinawa, and this happened. And there, matter of fact, there's a lance corporal right now in the brig in Okinawa still for not taking the vax. So if those things are happening, we've got to fix all of those things because I know that that lance corporal because we talked before she went in the brig, and she refused to take. The vaccines and you know they they threw the book at her um and she's in the brig right now you know unfortunately with my story uh that happened back in january 2016 that put me on my knees um and uh, was certainly uh you know my my right to due process with stress, medical malpractice medical negligence it, it really forced me to capitol hill as well uh, to do the honorable thing and stand up and fight for the rights of 20.2 million american veterans and now with folks like you that are coming out and that are standing up again for the good of the country, uh, to no benefit to, uh, to yourself, but again, to take care of your fellow soldiers, airmen, Marines, sailors, everybody in the DOD. Now, do you believe that these mandates were pulled uh, fairly recently, um, a month or two ago, do you believe that they were actually pulled because of these sudden deaths that are occurring in the DOD? No, sir. No, I sir. don't. I, I believe that it's the uh, the pressure that was put on them in order to get that done. I've got a flashing light here. Stand by. <laughs> okay, there we go. So uh, they were pulled because of the... Uh, I would say embarrassment, maybe um, pressure by by senators, congressmen, but mm -hmm. also more importantly, because of the they knew that the the House was uh, was chock full now more more so on the voting side, on the conservative side, and they knew that they were going to get voted against, and they hold the purse strings. This is always about you know what kind of money can we get on the next NDAA? I believe that's, that's Pete Chambers' uh, assessment of that. So there was a lot of pressure up there. Um, they gave a little bit, but they've still maintained the shadow policy because even though they pulled the mandates, remember those other things I was talking about, people are still stuck with TD TDY issues, flagging of orders. Uh, there's still a Marine in the brig, uh, a one that I know of. That's the only one that reached out and said, I need some help. Um, so those, those are the things that, that uh, we've got to keep, you know, squawking about because mm -hmm. Greasy's Greasy wheel is going to get the oil. Yeah, I know all about that. I had to go into Congress by myself. I didn't even have a member of Congress because, you know, he was indicted. So I fully, you know, I since I became an advocate, which is a it's a bad job. man. This job is full of anxiety and depression and just, you know, it but but it does, you know, when you're fighting for the greater good and, and being an advocate and, and and building up enough of that courage. I mean, it's tough to take on the federal government. And, you know, I'm 45 years old and really for the first time in my life, I get so many calls and emails from other veterans out there that are going through horrifying stuff at the VA or, you know, at, you know, in the DOD or, 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 or whatever it may be. And they're horrified of their government. I've, I've never seen a country, the United States of America, be actually scared of their government. Are, are you starting to kind of pick up on this a little bit? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Look, Look. Um, when when you do stand up, and then one of our whistleblowers did, you know, uh, Teresa Long, she stood up and she was going to testify with me in Tampa. She was called the night before by her commander that said, we will press charges on you, UCMJ, if you testify. Now, this is a whistleblower. There's a, such a thing as a whistleblower act. She was a federally subpoenaed 
witness. That's wit witness tampering. And she um, had information that could could help save people. And when she said, I'm sorry, I cannot. The judge said, excuse me, you cannot testify. No, sir, because I was ordered last night not to. That's how the extent that they're they some commanders are going to in order to uh, put a heavy hand on the people that are just trying to tell the truth. And honestly, there's once again, uh, what when I when I look at this, I don't just do it because I don't want to get on a show or I want to uh, you know, win something. I'm not about winning something here. I'm talking about just like when I was a, a special staff to a commander, we have I still consider the, the strata of this is a national defense problem. When we can't recruit. The army's down 20 percent. The worst that has been since 1973 post Vietnam. So I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about the tactical level, the people that I looked in the eye that were in the hospital or the ICU. And I'm thinking about the operational level. Can we fight wars? Can we close with and destroy the enemy? Because that's what we're trying to do. That's all that, that's all that really matters. All the other things that they're trying to push on the military to be the testing ground for, for society. I don't care what you do when you leave and you take your uniform off. As long as you can shoot, move, communicate, medicate, carry me off the battlefield if I'm wounded, that's all I care about. And guys like me that came across from different eras, we see that, and I've seen it get whittled away, especially since probably about 2013 till recent. We live in a country where it's an all-volunteer military. You know, we are the land of the free, the home of the brave. Um, we have um, served in so many wars for o over all these generations. And, and I think we're getting to a time right now where you said, look, Army recruitment's down 20 percent. And it's really not hard to figure out why. The kids that are growing up today say, you know, between the ages of 15 and 25 years old, they see their parents and their grandparents going through struggles with denials and deflections and burn pit can uh, cancers and the betrayal. And they see this and say, I, I don't want any part of that. How did we get here as a nation where, where you know, not the people of the nation, but the, the hierarchy here, you know, the government, the, the bureaucrats, the unelected bureaucrats that are setting all this policy out of nowhere and, and really preventing people from wanting to raise their hand and go in and sign to do the honorable thing because right, right. the government isn't even acting honorable in their own right. And, and again, I've always stood up honorably and have always <laughs> killed them with kindness because I wanted to be heard in an effective way and have that good sorts of, of communication and open and create a dialogue to where we can all understand and, and come to some common ground here. And, you know, but I'm, I'm just seeing so many people out there today that are so fearful and it, it's, it's just not feeling like the United States of America that I know. No, no, it's uh it's dystopian. And I know people use that word loosely, but uh, this is the way I see it. I'm going to use a little psychology here. Um, in the beginning of, let's just say the mandate thing, my, my current fight, but in the beginning of this thing in our country, a lot of people trusted our government, right? They just, okay, we trust the government. More and more people are questioning. And that can be a good thing and it could be a bad thing. And But what it's done is it's divided us. It's divided us. And I don't operate out of hate on the battlefield or anything. I can have righteous anger, and I do. Um, but I operate out of love, John 15, 13, not only for the people next to me in the, in the trenches, but the people that are back home, our kids. I've got a grandchild now. He's almost a, a year old in a few days. That's what I operate out of, love. And so we, when we see things happening to our fellow comrades that are that are still there or the ones that that the legacies that we ride on and we see the constitution for this of this republic that we are in being usurped by marxist ideology by uh corporations that are that are all about the bottom line and making a dollar and then we see them married up with people that are still in, the bureaucrats still in the military, be it a general officer or a special executive staff person that is uh, in between being, in, you know, it's kind of like a government GS, government service, or a DA civilian, but with a lot of more money and rank. Uh, when we see those, it makes you very disheartened, mm -hmm. demoralized. 
And guess what? Rule number one for a Marxist is you want to take over a country with, with communist ideals is to demoralize the population. And that's why I, I preach the love thing and to quit getting in the, you know, well, they're a, they're an anti-vaxxer. Well, they're a pure blood. When you start naming yourself, well, I'm a left, I'm a right. You're, you're, you're breaking up what is what I call the full spectrum American, which is the people in the middle of the bell curve who just want to go to work, yeah, pay their taxes, take care of their kids, watch them grow up, have kids, go to their weddings, do all those things. Because the thing I see that's common around the world is that no matter where you wear, whether you wear shoes or not, or whether you got to haul wood and chop water to eat and make fire, you just want joy. People just want joy. More, there are more good people, I believe, out there than there is evil people. But the evil ones who own the corporations, who own the media, they want to split us. They want to, to polarize us. We're just not going to We're Americans, my God. I, I fully agree with that. And, you know, people look at me as, oh, a big, tough Marine, dude, I got a heart of, of gold. My little girls, I mean, I paint her fingernails. Peace, love, hope, and joy. I, I love my family more than anything, more than life itself. I have such a great relationship with my four beautiful children, my wife of 25 years. Literally, peace, love, hope, and joy. And I don't show this often, but it's I've gotten so consumed over the years. And I'm like, okay, I can't be angry about that. I can't worry. And I can't let politics drive my life. So I, I've created that. And, and then I also have picked up the Bible. Okay. And, and I studied the Bible because I'm like, okay, there's a bigger picture going on here. I need God in my life. I need guidance. Okay. And, and I need to get it directly from the script, uh, from the scripture. And I need to constantly remind myself that, I'm not going to change this world. I'm not going to change what's going on around me, but I can make it a better place for me and for the people in my circle. And by by doing that, that's how we can grow this into being one again and into not having that division. You know, like you said, demoralize and divide. That That's the fastest way to overthrow a country. Right. And I love my country. Um, and I've got kids and I want them to grow up in a in, in a land that, you know, is prosperous, that's full of opportunity and equal justice for all. That's what I want. Yeah, and, yeah. and you're right. History is still being written and it takes men like you and it takes leaders like you to stand up against adversity when it comes to knocking on that door and open that door up in an honorable way. And, and to fight for what's right without burning stuff down and going and running and, and, and being vigilantes in cities and to say, look, I need my credibility because the people I'm fighting, they don't have any credibility. But because the, they, they are up here and I'm down here, I need to constantly prove my worth. I need to constantly prove my credibility because these guys are going to call me crazy when I'm actually not crazy. But <laughs> If they don't like what you're saying, they're going to characterize you as crazy and you need to prove yourself otherwise. And that's why when I went into lobby in Congress, mm -hmm. everything I did was 100 percent professional, 100 percent backed up with facts and proof and everything else. The same way that you've lobbied and in the same way that you have fought for the good of the country. Now, you remained off the media grid, like you said, you know, former SF guy, you know, Green Beret, flight surgeon. You, you just want to retire and right off into the sunset. But until, you know, it was revealed, you know, by Senator uh, Ron Johnson, you know, you becoming a whistleblower and exposing the facts related to the defense medical epi epidemiology uh, database. Can you explain how what that was? So, so the, the database is used as a, for us, as kind of a sentinel event warning indicator. Imagine mm -hmm. something, a red light goes off in your car. So the way it should work is this. If there was an 1100% rise in neurologic deficits, we would get a, um, like in the flight world, they call it a NOTAM, a notice to airmen. So, hey, guess what, flight surgeons or doctors across the board, you're seeing a lot of this. It's on a rise. Before it gets to 1100%, you should be able to notify us. But it didn't happen that way. And the taxpayers pay a lot of money for a company called Unisant to to operate that data system. They didn't they failed their job. They failed their job. And there that is a concern also because the for for other reasons, you know, expenditures. But for us, 
we went from zero to 100 on on disorders really quickly and didn't have the warning notice so when we gave that information to include there's under a foia we were able to pull and 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 exhibit it in tampa steel versus lloyd austin 1291 adverse reactions just to pfizer alone 1291 different ones that were based upon earlier studies well now we're in a phase three trial and they're still changing the the, the mix we don't know what's in these things and we know that they're not safe and they're not effective and we can do it by lesser intrusive means i did it on the border we had twelve thousand people walking across a week at the time nobody was vaxxed nobody was nobody had a, a, a covid card i just did good threat medicine stuff that i was taught to do in 2003 is my initial entry as a, as a military doc so that's where i can see that we can do it by lesser intrusive means when the army says or the dod says but it's it makes you combat ineffective because of readiness. No, mm -hmm. we're actually more combat effective when we don't have something that's injuring our troops, and it's not required because it doesn't seem to be working. And I can yeah. do it by lesser intrusive means. All those things. That's common sense. When you try to explain that though to people that um, have blinders on, um, it's difficult. It doesn't mean I'm gonna, I'm, I'm going to stop. It's just difficult. Um, yeah. But yeah, that that's that's a good yeah. It was a good question. Yeah, no, you know, like when we started, I said, look, I'm all for medical freedom. I, I'm, I'm for medical choice, informed consent, for liberty, for freedom, right? The hallmarks of being an American. I want right. to know, what was it like? Because I, I know you weren't the only doctor down there. Well, what, I was the only doc. They had PAs, too. What was their take on this? So if, so if you were the only doctor down there... And you had PAs down there. I mean, you had colleagues down there. Were your colleagues saying, I'm not standing with that doctor? Or did they say, no, he's right, and I'm going to stand with him? I think that there's a thing that takes place, and that gets back to my categories of different things. When we had in the beginning the cognitive dissonance thing going on where that means, uh, well, I used to smoke six packs a day. Now I smoke one. So it's not that bad. Well, that's not science, right? That's just I'm look. I'm overlooking something that really should be brought up, um, and then there's this uh, mass formation where we just follow the mass. When I was the commander down there of the medical detachments, et cetera, as well as working as a special operations liaison to the Texas Rangers, when I was down there, they followed my lead because I'm a leader. That's what you do, right? You set the tone, and this is my commander's intent, and this is what I expect. So there weren't any questions whether they agreed with me or not. They might not have, but my other colleagues in the state, of which there were about 90, um, I wrote a white paper and sent it out to all of them saying, hey, this is what I'm seeing. I'm the only, I'm the biggest show in town right now in Texas. You know, this is what I'm seeing. And one of them actually, a uh, senior ranking to me, a colonel, sent me back an email and said, uh, I don't care what you think. This is uh, not what we're going to discuss with these other providers. OK, so he tried to squash me. No problem. Um, so I would talk to individuals that I knew and they would argue with me, but it was good dialogue argument. Not bad. I don't mind that. We can disagree. But they, they always came back to, man, I'm glad in, I'm not in your shoes right now during this event. And you're right. Informed consent is primary. And if mm -hmm. I believe that it was that, that's the way I did the informed consent. It's not informed tell them to do or not to do. It's informed consent. Here's the facts. You, cho you choose. You mentioned psychology, you know, doctor. Um, and you said some things earlier. Again, I'm going to go back to because I think it's very important for people to understand. Demoralize and divide. We have, you know, you said it's not about the left or the right. But the problem is, is our country has become so far apart. Leftist extremists, right extremists, black, white. There's no gray area anymore. Like how the United States of America used to operate. Like we, 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 we fight nations that are radicalized, and I'm seeing our country starting to become radicalized, and I don't like it one bit because it's not who we are as Americans, right? United we stand and divided we fall. Are you starting to see some sort of this mental warfare being played out in the United States of America? Oh, that's a great question. 
Yeah, that yeah, that, uh, that fifth generation warfare is something that's been going on forever. People think that it's first, second, third, fourth, fifth. That's how it happens. First generation warfare is rocks and sticks. Well, that happened on the streets of Portland, right? Second generation, bayonets. Now here comes cannons. We get all the way to fifth. Fifth is up here, and it's in your here. And it's media, and it's control of the mind. Not that you, they actually control your thoughts, but that they control, they sway your thoughts. They being media, uh, being extensions of whatever. Uh, look, look, follow the money. Who owns the media? I mean, if we follow that, I'm not doing tin hat stuff. I'm just saying follow the money. That's how I find bad guys downrange. So if I if I follow the money and I see who's doing that and I see who's saying this, here's what I what I want to give to you from the psychological standpoint. There's a thing mm -hmm. called Hegelian dialectics. Hegelian dialectics are like this. Here's the left, here's the right, and we are opposed in our discussion. And when somebody comes in and says that, well, the synthesis, what I want to create out of this thesis on this side and antithesis on, antithesis on this side or antithesis, I'm going to create some, I'm going to push them further apart. And then they become radicalized. Here's what they do. They come in and they create an argument. So you got CNN and you got Fox News. And those two are arguing. Everybody's going, yeah, yeah. And they get into this dialectic. But what happens? The bad guys input in on the output. They want this. And they have pushed us aside, more radicalized, hatred. Uh, we can't have just a normal debate. Like, I love debate. If then, therefore. I love that because I learn things. And I'm able to shift my focus if you will, if I believe that what the person is telling me is right. The debate is good. On the team room, when we were in the teams, you're in the team room, it's a, it's a debate. Sometimes it's a fisticuffs debate. As soon as you leave the team room, you love each other. But it's a debate, but that's okay. That's what makes us better. It sharpens us because iron sharpens iron when it's done out of love. When mm -hmm. you do it out of hate, it's division. That's the synthesis of this whole thing, of the inputs coming in. So Hegelian dialectics are used. And this is a good thing for your listeners to understand. If there's an argument being posed, a, a counterpose, I see it happen on social media all the time where people argue and then it escalates. You ever notice those where they're just like all of a sudden F-bombs are being dropped and, you know, then they, I'm getting off this chat. Okay. Well, what happens is, is that you take a litmus test or you check your own pulse. And if just like on your card, you say, this is my controls right here. This is my threshold. You say, is this eliciting an emotional response? And if I'm listening. Yes, yeah. turn it off. Cleave it. Get rid of it. Open up a Bible and read about whatever it is in Psalms or Proverbs about wisdom and get off of that because you can't be emotional in these kinds of things. It makes you, it'll drive you crazy. It'll make you sick. Yeah. Yes. I, I had on my good buddy Morgan on the trail a couple of weeks ago and he said the same thing. Look, it, some of the stuff that's going on, it'll make, it'll make you sick. And, 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 and really, at the end of the day, you know, you got to just, you know, live in the moment, have that peace, have that love, hope, joy, love your family, do right by others, you know, love thy neighbor, right. if you will. Right. Uh, I just, so I have a friend, Craig Sawyer. Do you know Craig? Saw man. Saw man. Yeah. Good buddy of mine. He speaks about, I've learned so much from, from Craig on, on exactly just that, that, that fifth generation warfare. And it, it's very interesting. He, he talks about it a lot. He, 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 he's always down on the border, uh, uh, veterans for child rescue. And I know you've, you know, you know, you've been at, down on that border working that what 1,300 or 1,248 miles of that Rio Grande, uh, you know, in Texas, uh, you know, serving Texas honorably. And, you know, you, you guys have a lot of the same points, but you guys are very intelligent men. And, you know, you know, like you said, oh, I don't want to put the tinfoil hat on. No, no, no. What you're saying is actually true and it's very real, but that's what one side wants to make you believe is that if we don't agree with you, we're just going to call you crazy. And, you, and that's not fair, you know, because just because you have a point and you have an opinion doesn't mean that you're crazy. I mean, you're a doctor, you're, you're a surgeon, you're a green beret. I mean, you've done it all and you've done it in great fashion. And again, you've done it in an honorable way. And if people could just sit down 
to agree to disagree, we're going to find out we're, we got a lot more in common than what we actually think. Like Chris Ledoux says, you know, and a, a lot of his uh, uh, country songs. Mm-hmm. Where, where are we headed, Lu- uh, 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 Lieutenant Colonel Chambers? Where are we headed? Wow. Um, I believe that we're going to be going through a little bit of a rough period here coming up here soon. And it's only because of other economic factors. Um, I can't I don't have a crystal ball on what's happening in 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 the Ukraine, if this thing kicks off or not. Uh, but Food is going to be short, short for a while. I believe fuel prices are going to be through the roof and that's going to cause that, especially diesel. Um, but these are things that I look at in the think tank that I'm in down there in Austin. Um, with other people that are way smarter than I am on this. But uh, I believe, first of all, I believe in my Savior, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and, and that, that we don't live in a spirit of fear. And this is something I learned from my kid. And I'm going to tell you, if you adopt this, then where we're heading will be okay. And this is it. Uh, when he was a little guy and he's listening to his music and it was Philippians 4, 6, and 7, this music, this song, it stuck in my head because I was listening, I was playing it for him in the car all the time, in the truck. Well, I got deployed downrange, and I used to say that thing in my head while I was either shooting, moving, communicating, or medicating because I needed to keep my hands steady because a doctor doing this ain't no good, right? Mm -hmm. So do not be anxious about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition, present your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Now imagine taking shots in between all that because that's what I was doing or so cheering somebody up or holding pressure on a wound. But if you work and you control the controllables, which is how you do chaos, if you do that and you put your faith and trust in that, then we you will not live in a spirit of fear and we'll come out of this okay and you'll take care of your neighbors. And that's what we do down there and uh, all the way from Stevensville to uh, down to uh, Bastrop and all the way over to uh, Dripping Springs and, and down below us to, to Casterville. There are groups of people out there that take care of each other. It's like a neighborhood watch on steroids because it's about love. What's the motivation? What's the motivation behind this? Because I, I, every day I say not, nothing makes sense anymore. I don't know up from down. I don't know what fact and fiction. And, you know, I, I I just don't understand the motivation behind all of this. Do yeah. You, do you? I don't understand it, but I but I see it for what it is. The same eyes that I saw in the in the combatant that wanted to to kill me. Um, after we had to capture them, um, there's hate in this world. There's evil in this world. I don't understand that, but I understand what it takes to, uh, to fight that. And I, and in this case, it's not kinetic. It's, it's, uh, it's operating out of love, but it's also operating out of, um, righteous anger. So you can flip a table. You can, you know, call somebody out. You can have a debate. And when they throw something back at you, like, deny, counter accuse and throw it back to you with your tin hat. It's okay. I'm going to cleave that conversation, but I'm still going to get to my end state, which is my commander's end state, which is to uh, leave no man behind, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Uh, and at this point, point is God. Um, and, and the Constitution of the United States and the Republic for which it stands, that's that's why we're doing this for our side. You know, we'll mm-hmm. call that the white hats, right? Where's my white hat? That's my white hat. <laughs> my black hat's up here. You know, when I want to, when I want righteous anger, I put that one on. Um, but that's why we do it. But I don't understand the evil thing, but people do evil things. When you got a lot of money and you've got a lot of uh, ability to print money, uh, you can do evil things and get away with it. And when there is no oversight, you know, I would, I would love to talk to Marcus sometime. I've met him once there in Dripping Springs, but to, uh, to infuse some of the things that are happening on the ground, which he has a great knowledge of, I, I talked to him. Um, but other people that I talk to on the Hill don't, and that's what we have to do now. So guys like me who can't operate all the way to the political level, we need to continue to infuse and, and your listeners, what can we do? We can infuse them locally, infuse those truths to your local leaders. Absolutely. Uh, you know, you couldn't have said it better. Now you, um, are now sitting on the board of directors, uh, of global tech MD telemedicine group. Alongside mm-hmm. retired General Michael Flynn, we we got about four minutes remaining here on this program. Can you explain that? Sure. Sure. So, so, it's a medicine company, but it's based upon a lot of alternate modalities, naturopathic medicine, uh, all the way to regular allopathic, 
it's a telemedicine company. You can call in, get scripts. You can talk to the doctor. You can get things. It's you, There's no hands-on. It's telemedicine, but that's what that is. But uh, we have people um, that are out there that are supporting this thing. If you look at the board of directors, these are all people that are enlightened, who are uh, non, not that they're not believers, but if you, if you just focus on big pharma results or, or um, adjuncts therapies, if you just focus on that, you can't do what really what we need to do, which is let the body heal itself. God created this perfect body, de deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA. It's an amazing structure. If we let the body heal by, remember this adage, garbage in, garbage out. If you let the body heal, it'll do it. And that's what these people are focused on. That's why I, I enjoy that. And I'm a strategic advisor. I'm on the advisory role board. And so that's what we do. Outstanding. You know, I had a very honorable man on yesterday, a retired U.S. Marine First Sergeant, uh, Demias Perdue. And he is an emotional intelligence expert. And, uh, you know, I tell you that that uh, this is a new industry. And I think people are seeing that this whole mental warfare game being played out. And, it, and, and we're seeing it every day with anxiety and depression and suicide as a whole. It's never been this high as a country. We are a country that is very sick right now mentally. And we're checking that pulse. And, and I tell you, it, it's not it's not a good outlook. But what he does is he goes out and he teaches people how to deal and, 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 and cope with life, you know, and, you know, what angers you, what, you know, you know, and, and all the the vortexes and the frontal lobes of your brain and how everything works and how we can make better decisions. Right, right. And, uh, you know, this is huge. You know, it really is emotional intelligence. You know, you were talking about fifth genera uh, uh, generation warfare and uh, recruitment of, of our military and medical freedom. And, you know, all this other stuff here that just all coincides with the last three and a half years that we've actually lived through here um, in, in, in not only our country, but in the world, you know, as a whole. But man, you have been a very interesting guest. I and, and I'd love to have you back sometime. I sincerely love, appreciate love everything you're doing, um, you know, in the in the community to, uh, you know, to make it all a better place, you know, for you, for me, um, you know, and every American. Uh, I always like to end the program on a positive message, some inspiration out there, some encouragement to maybe some folks out there that may be needing to be lifted up. Do you have any words of wisdom or advice that, that you could offer, Doctor? Yeah, yeah, I do. I and it, it's based upon a, a historical event on June 6, 1944, on the beaches of Normandy, and the 1st Infantry Division was going in on Omaha Beach. And uh, there was a colonel, and this is pretty rare, but there was a colonel on the beach with the troops. And uh, he looked around and said, there's two kinds of soldiers on this beach, the dead and those who will die. Follow me. Let's go. And they moved. OK, so the encouragement here is that we move. If we move as a whole and we do, if we if we see something that just doesn't make sense, measure three times and cut once and and pray about it and act. Right. The OODA loop thing, observe, orient, decide, act act because you got to move because this is a time sensitive environment and it's a race to save humanity it's a race to save humanity really in this for us it's a race to save the constitution of this republic don't 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 change the terms because people do it's it's a republic and, it, and if you do that and you race that to that end and you do it every single day and you get up and look for work i promise you you will be fulfilled you will do it. You will operate not a spirit of fear, but a spirit of boldness and take care of each other and love each other, because that's what this is about. America and Texas. Right. Forward is emotion. A body at rest stays at rest and a body that is active will stay active. And that's what we need to do. You know, we need to work together. We need to fight together. We need to stand together. We need to unite together for a better America. Uh, you know, for us and uh, for the future generations. Colonel, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we sincerely appreciate everything you have done and continue to do in the military and veteran community. Your service, sacrifice, and dedication to our great nation is truly admirable. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you. And, 
as not a Marine, but somebody who worked with Marine Semper Fi. Right. Folks, remember to stay inspired, stay encouraged, stay motivated, and always stay in the fight. Until next time, for Today with Tally, this is Brian Tally. Good night, Semper Fi.